Hi everyone, welcome to the weekend Q&A. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with what the weekend Q&As are, I basically take questions all weekend and answer them and then publish the video on a Monday. Now, there are three main ways you can get me questions. The first one is via Patreon. Now, if you're not familiar with what Patreon is, this is my Patreon page, and I'll leave a link to this in the video description. You can support me by making a small monthly contribution, and it gets you various perks, including priority on your questions for the Q&A sessions. Now, there are a couple of other ways you can get me questions. One of them is via Twitter, tweeting me at Geekanoids and using the hashtag GeekQA, or you can make a donation request, and there's a link to that in the video description as well. And basically, people will use those for if they want a shout out, or have a very in-depth question they want answering. So on with this week's questions, and the first one comes from one of the patrons for Geekanoids, David, thank you very much for your support. And David's question is, any tips for getting companies to send gear for review? How did you get companies to send you gear when you first started out? Well, first of all, let me just uh, let you know that when I started out, there are a lot less people making YouTube videos, so it was a lot easier back in the day. Now that's not to say it was extremely easy, and I started out by just asking for small items, things like mobile phone cases, and the first thing I actually reviewed was an iPod case from Griffin Technology. And then I would ask for gradually sort of uh, bigger and more expensive items as I progressed on YouTube. So as my audience grew, I could actually get companies to send me more expensive items because their trust in me grew as well. Now. It wasn't yes, yes, yes from every company. It was sort of a little bit like playing a lottery. And it is still to this day. You can send out maybe 20, 30, 40 emails and maybe only get one or two responses. What you've got to remember is there are lots and lots of people asking for product. So it's not easy. There's no quick way of doing it. My main advice to you is really when you're starting out nowadays is to actually review the technology you've got. So if you own a smartphone or a camera or you're making videos about, I don't know, gardening products, review the products you've actually got to hand. And then once you've built a small audience, then you can start approaching companies. But don't expect them just to say yes. You have to build relationships with these companies. You have to have something to offer them. You have to be able to give some exposure to their products. After all, there's no point in them sending you out uh, the latest digital camera if you've only got one or two subscribers. You have to have a subscriber base first. Now, if you've got friends and family as well that have got technology, ask them very nicely if they could lend you their camera or their smartphone or whatever sort of product you're going to be covering on your channel. And if they can lend it to you for a few days or even just 24 hours, you can do a sort of first impressions video and that enables you to develop your style and then hopefully you will attract an audience. And as I say, once you've got a small audience, then you can start approaching companies. So I hope that's helped. As I say, there's no easy way, it's a lot of hard work. A lot of people think that it's just very easy to pick up a camera, set up a channel, and then all of these companies are gonna start sending you products. Something else I should also mention is the majority of products are loan products. So for example, when I review a mobile phone from Nokia, or if Vodafone send me a smartphone through to review, it's normally on a two week loan period. So there's no free sort of handout from these companies. They're lending you the phone to evaluate, make the video about, and then they either pick it up or you return it under your own sort of steam. So as I say, I hope that helps. That is a brilliant question, David, and thank you for your support on Patreon. Now we've got questions that have come in via Twitter, and there are a lot of them to go through in this first segment of the video. The first one is from Tom Crockett, who asks, what are the best over-ear or on-ear headphones for around 150 pounds? There's only one I would recommend at that price point, and that's the Audio Technica ATH-M50, and they've reduced in price to around about £120 now, because there is a new version out called the ATH-M50X. They're exactly the same, except instead of having a hardwired cable, they've got a detachable cable. Brilliant, brilliant headphones. Uh, Heidi, or Heidi, and I still don't, you're going to have to let me know, how do I pronounce your name? Let's say Heidi asks, does megapixel sensor mean anything in a camera? Some of them has less and shoots better pics than the higher ones, explain please. But it's all relative to the size of the sensor. If you put 20 megapixels on a tiny, tiny sensor, it's not gonna be very good in low light 
and you're going to get some sort of noise appearing in some of your photos. If you put 20 megapixels on a larger sensor, then each of those pixels is going to gather more light and result in a better picture. So that's why some manufacturers have lower megapixel counts and some of them really push the boundaries and go for this high megapixel count. But what you will find is that with like a full frame camera, which has got a much larger sensor, with higher megapixels, you're still going to get good low light ability. With smartphones, for example, the iPhone 5S I'm reading these questions off of, that's got an 8 megapixel sensor, tiny little sensor inside a smartphone, and then something like an HTC One, they went for a 4 megapixel sensor so that each of those pixels actually gathers more light. And it is noticeable in the photos, so I hope that explains it a little bit for you. And then Heidi also asks, best budget camera for shooting pics outdoors? Only for photos, not video or YouTube. Uh, cheers. Well, you need to quantify your question because you haven't given me a budget. I could say something like a Fuji X20, which was one of my favourite cameras. You can't swap out the lenses, but it just gave a really nice detailed picture. Good in low light and just a, a really nice colour rendition as well on the photos. So maybe check that out. But if you're just looking for a, a, an easy snapper, check out something like the Canon PowerShot range, they're really good. Uh, or even maybe check out the Olympus Pen range if you're looking for something with interchangeable lenses, because that would give you a, a really good camera that you could then grow with and, and explore your photography a lot more. Maybe you'll find a certain style that you like and you can swap up the lenses for maybe a macro lens if you get into macro photography. Next question is from Ryan. I can't believe you asked this question. How much wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? I think you should ask Siri that one. Now, moving on, Jussie asks, would be interested to hear your thoughts and tips on launching a new business like you did with New Media Creator. Well, it's not easy at all. It's not just as simple as creating a website and putting a website up there. You need to do some marketing on it. You need to obviously do your research before you actually launch a new business. Check that there is a demand for the product that you're actually offering or the service you're offering. And then to sort of tread lightly when you actually launch the website. I launched New Media Creator and I could have spammed everyone with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tweets. But that's not the way to do it. Do things gradually, build up respect for the website and the service you're offering. And as I say, a lot of it is to do with researching before you actually launch something. Now with New Media Creator, I'm offering up microphones and motivational prints. They don't really seem to go together, but I thought they did because motivating people when they're working perhaps by themselves, I think is a very good thing. And I also am in touch with a lot of creators. So I wanted to offer them really good prices on microphones and editing products. And to date, it's gone extremely well. I'm really pleased with how it's been performing. But as I say, don't just expect people to visit your website. Just as, a, as an example, I actually watched uh, Pound Shop Wars on television recently, and that was extremely interesting. I'll tell you why, it's because the Pound Shop that they're mainly covering was launching online, and there was also a, a competitor launching online as well, and they launched their website and just expected people to find it and start ordering, and of course it didn't happen in the first 24 hours. I think they only took one order. So, you know, don't just assume you're gonna get visitors to your website. Great question though, and it's something that you, I could probably spend a whole video on, and maybe I'll do that in the future. Uh, Mr. Faisal247 asks, what car do you drive? I drive a Mini Cooper, a red one, really pleased with it, and I need a desk or something to make YouTube videos, and what do you recommend? Keep up the good videos. Thank you very much for your nice comments, first of all. With regards to a desk, I would really recommend, especially if you're on a budget, looking at Ikea, because you can mix and match different table legs with different colored tabletops. And if you damage the tabletop, they're very, very cheap to replace. And you can get things like white, gray, you can get wood effect, green, even a stainless steel worktop. And as I say, you can mix and match those with a different style leg to suit your decor. And they work really well for uh, uh, creating a backdrop for YouTube videos as well. Also, if you've got a desk already and you don't necessarily want to change it, why not invest in some sort of uh, coloured boards to go underneath products that you're actually reviewing? And then you can swap out the colours from time to time. I know a lot of YouTubers do that, myself included. 
I've got these plastic sheets that are various colours. They're meant for photography, but I use them for my videos. Next question is from Rene Barber. What is the best Blu-ray player to get right now for someone who is upgrading a DVD player? Well, again, you didn't give me a budget, so I could suggest something like just a regular Samsung or LG Blu-ray player, which you could pick up for under £100 quite easily nowadays. Something like a PS4 or an Xbox One, both play Blu-rays. For me, if you're looking for good quality, then I've got an Oppo Blu-ray player. Yes, Oppo do make Blu-ray players as well as smartphones. But if you check out Oppo Blu-ray players online, you'll find a lot of different models. Uh, they're not cheap, but I feel that they offer a much better picture, uh, much better sort of contrast in the, in the darker areas, uh, and really pick out some really good detail in dark areas. So do check them out. Next one is from iDroid Arena. What's your opinion of the Samsung Galaxy S5, Xperia Z2, Z2 tablet, and even the Nokia X, X Plus, and XL? Well, I did cover this in my Mobile World Congress sort of video where I discussed what phones have been announced. I'll leave a link to that in the video description. But just briefly, Samsung Galaxy S5 looks very interesting. Loads of features, nice screen. 4K video recording, they're the highlights. But I think Samsung missed a trick by not improving the actual materials they used. If they'd gone all metal or just done something a little bit different, I think they'd have got a lot more interest. Xperia Z2 and Z2 tablet. I've got no opinion on the Z2 tablet, unfortunately, because I haven't researched it. But it, it, from what I've heard, it sounds okay, very high spec. The Z2 smartphone was the highlight for me at Mobile World Congress. Beautiful screen. 4K video recording, great camera, and I'm really looking forward to getting one of those in. Nokia X, X Plus, and XL. Well, Android comes to the Nokia range of smartphones. Not very convinced that they made the right choice by skinning it so much and making it this simple tile interface. Also, no Google Play Store support. But I'm going to reserve my judgment until I've actually got one into the studio. Hi, everyone. So it's now Sunday, and I'm relaxing. Believe it or not, yes, I'm relaxing, even though I've come into the studio just to record another sort of segment for you. And I've got this. I'm addicted to this at the moment. This is dried mango. I'm not going to eat this because you'll have to put up with me chewing on camera then, but I shall eat that in a short while. Anyway, on with the questions. So I've got some more questions coming. And uh, the first one is from somebody called Andrew, who says, in some of your videos, you mention that you do commercial videos. What does this mean? Do you make adverts? Well, it's a very, very good question actually. And yeah, I can understand why commercials are some, sometimes called adverts. You might have thought I make adverts, but no, I don't make adverts. Uh, by commercial videos, I mean videos for companies and they're totally separate to the YouTube videos I make. The YouTube videos are free. I don't charge for reviews or for testing products or for offering up my opinion about something. But when I do a commercial video or a video for a business, it's something along the lines of perhaps a demonstration, perhaps of a, a tripod or a flash unit for a camera or a smartphone or an accessory, something along those lines. And a company would approach me and say, we want a demonstration video made whereby I would make the video and I would offer no opinion on the product at all. I would purely just show it on camera I would explain what the features and functions are, and then I would deliver them a video in all the different formats, uh, in HD, 1080p, 720p, etc. And they would use that video in a number of different ways. For example, videos that I've done for clients before have been used as Amazon product videos, or they've been used for internal sales use, so perhaps they're doing demonstrations to sales reps, and they wanna use the video to demonstrate how the product actually works so that salesman can then go out and sell that into the retail chain. So things like that, that's what I'm referring to uh, about commercial videos. And of course they attract a fee and that's another revenue stream for the business that I run. So really, really good question and I really do appreciate you asking that. I hope that has uh, sort of helped you, helped you out with that answer. And then the next question is from United by Photography on Twitter. Uh, your thoughts on the Panasonic GH4 shooting 4K? Have you checked it out? Yes, I have checked it out. 
and I'm super, super excited about it. There are two 4K cameras I'm excited about. One of them is the Sony uh, AX100, I think it is, or is it the AX1000? Well, there's a new Sony camcorder coming out that shoots 4K video. But I'm less interested in that the more I read about it than I am about the Panasonic GH4. And I'll tell you why I'm really excited about the GH4. The first reason is this is my sort of main production camera. This is a Panasonic DMC G6 Micro Four Thirds camera. And the GH4 is a Micro Four Thirds camera, so I can use my existing lenses with the new camera. That's not the only decision in uh, actually purchasing one. Uh, but the other excitement, of course, as you mentioned, is it sh shoots 4K video. So very, very excited to be able to start producing 4K videos. I've seen some fantastic tech videos from YouTubers shot in 4K and I couldn't afford the entry point required to actually get a 4K camera, camera before now. So hopefully the Panasonic GH4 will come in at a price point around about sort of £1,500 and that is a, just about affordable as an investment for me for Geekanoids. I'm also really excited that it also shoots 1080p, so 1920 by 1080 resolution, up to 200 megabits per second, so really high bit rate on the video, which should give some really fantastic results. I'm not sure it does, to, I don't think it does 200 megabits per second in 4K, because that would be an amazing amount of data for it to handle, I just don't think it would do that. And then there's also this add-on unit that you can get for, um, uh, for the, this camera that adds on XLR inputs and some other features as well. Oh, it adds on a, a power input, so you can actually run it off of mains power while you're recording. And that really interests me as well. But my only fear with this unit that's the add-on unit is that they're going to overprice it. I think it might come in at around about six, seven hundred pounds. So it's going to take some extra consideration for me whether I invest in one of those as well. Uh, but as I say, the Sony did really interest me. I think I've pretty much made my decision now that I'm going to wait for the Panasonic GH4 to become available. Brilliant, brilliant question. So I've got one more question that came in via email. And let me just get this up. This is from David. And this is about camcorders. Uh, he says, you always used to use Panasonic camcorders and then you switched over to Micro Four Thirds. Was there a reason why? And would you ever buy one of the new Panasonic camcorders? And he lists a V750 and a W850. Well, uh, I probably would consider another camcorder uh, if I wasn't looking at the GH4. When I was using Panasonic camcorders to make my videos for Geekanoids, very, very good quality, extremely good. Uh, I went through a series of different models and all of them really, really good quality video. These two new ones that you mentioned, the V750 and the W850, have just started to become available in the retail chain. And actually, I was only just looking at them yesterday. The W850 has this swing out screen and it has a camera on the screen as well. So you can articulate that little tiny camera and you can capture your responses to maybe your kid playing football is the example they use. Or maybe you're just capturing a really nice scene and you want to be able to have a superimposed image of yourself on the screen at the same time. And it captures feeds from both of those cameras at the same time. Now, the V750, from what I can see, is identical in every respect, apart from it doesn't have that secondary camera. And both of them have Wi-Fi, NFC. They record up to 50 megabits per second in MP4 format. And they also record AVCHD. Now, one thing that interested me with both of those cameras and one or two of the lower models is they do this CTR1 unit, I think it is. There's some letters before the CTR1, but it's basically a base that runs off of mains or battery, has a tripod mount on the top, so you can mount the camcorder on it, and a tripod mount on the bottom, so you can mount it to a tripod. And then you sit your camcorder on top of this, and it's got a couple of modes. One of them's like a remote control mode, so you can pan the camera left to right, up and down, or you can set it to auto mode and it actually pans around to a, a face detection, for example. So it will actually follow you around as you move. And if you stand still, it will then reframe the picture, the video sort of frame, and actually zoom in on the subject. So it just looks really, really interesting. And both of these camcorders also support, uh, sorry, going back to the camcorders, they both also support microphones. So if you think 
uh, an external microphone with one of these cameras and one of these sort of rotating bases, that could be very similar to having a professional cameraman behind the camera and actually recording you presenting to the camera. Um, I hope that made sense. It wouldn't be a professional cameraman because from what I've seen, the zooming in and out sometimes doesn't quite match what's going on on the screen. And sometimes it lags behind a little bit when you move, so it sort of tries to overcompensate. But they might have just been bad examples. So both of those camcorders, this is a very long answer, but both of them really do interest me. And I've almost been tempted on pushing the buy button just to get one in so I can share my experience with you. But my only fear of getting one into the studio is that people have seem to have moved on from camcorders. I'd be interested to know actually, because I don't ask this question very much, but how many of you use a compact camera? How many of you use a camcorder? How many of you use perhaps a micro four thirds or DSLR to capture videos for YouTube? Do let me know. Or not necessarily for YouTube, if you're just capturing family videos as well or, or days out, what do you use to capture your video? I'd be really, really interested. So leave that in the comment section below. So that's it for this rather long weekend Q&A. Thank you very much to everyone who takes part. It really does uh, make me smile seeing all of the questions come in. And I can talk technology for absolutely hours. I really do love it. If you've got any more questions, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, there are a few ways you can get me questions and details of how to get me them are in the video description underneath this video. So please do check that out. Don't forget to also check out my Patreon campaign. There's a link to that in the video description as well. Thank you for all of your support and your lovely comments. Have a fantastic week ahead of you and I will see you all in the next one. That didn't sound right, did it? Let's do it again. I'll see you all in the next video. Thanks so much for watching the video. If you'd like to watch another amazing video from me, please do click that top box. And if you want to subscribe to my geeky channel, click the red box on the bottom of your screen now. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.